has joined us today in the sanctuary and to those joining us live on Facebook. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We are so glad to be here together in worship this morning. As we prepare our hearts to go before our awesome God, would you please pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this beautiful, sunshiny day. We're all still recovering from winter and from the last year of being isolated. Lord, we thank you for all of the things you've given us, not just the nice weather and the seasons, but all of the other things that have been provided. Lord, be with us now as we open our hearts towards you and see what you have to tell us. In your name we pray. Amen. Trust in Jesus, trusting in his name and his word this morning. Let's sing together. It is so sweet. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take it at his word, just to rest in
tells us about the amazing love of Jesus, it's not a mystery. He loves us tenderly. Come behold the wondrous mystery. is you're coming for us and you are coming soon. Father, we need you so desperately in this time, in this place. We need the love of our Savior, the grace and mercy of God our Father. And so, Father, now as we gather in this place, would you then send your Holy Spirit as a gift, as a sign, as a seal of your love and your grace for us. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Psalm 119, 57 through 64. You are my portion, Lord. I have promised to obey your words. I have sought your face with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. I have considered my ways and have turned my steps to your statutes. I will hasten and not delay to obey your commands. Though the wicked bind me with ropes, I will not forget your law. At midnight, I rise to give you thanks for your righteous laws. I am a friend to all who fear you, to all who follow your precepts. 
The earth is filled with your love, Lord. Teach me your decrees. There's only one item of family business today. Just a reminder that after today's service, there will be a congregational meeting immediately following in the Beacon Room, um, in person, and also via Zoom. Um, in today's bulletin, if you're here in the sanctuary, you saw a list of prayer concerns. Also, remember that there is a postcard 
sized um, item in there. Be sure to fill that out and let us know of any prayer concerns or any other information that might have changed or that the church office should know. With that in mind, please join me in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we know that you know everyone's need, whether it be spiritual, emotional, physical, or financial. You know what it is. Lord, please let us trust you enough so that we give those needs over to you. Let's not be afraid to ask for your help and your blessing. Lord, we know you will provide it. We just have to trust and obey. Lord, be with us today as we listen to the message about Jonah. He wasn't very trusting at first, and he didn't want to obey. But Lord, he learned that that was the right way to go. Be with us as we also learn the right way to go. In your name we pray. Amen. supposed to have it all together and when they ask you how you're doing just smile and tell them never better by number two everybody's life is perfect except yours so keep your messes and your wounds your secrets safe with you behind closed doors
brothers and sisters, as we come to sit under the word of God this morning, would you stand wherever you are as we give God's word its full authority in our hearts and in our minds and in our lives today? Today we read from Jonah chapter 3. We're going to get the first verse. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word for this day. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message that I give to you. Jonah obeyed the word of God and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 days more and the city will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne. He took off his royal robes, he covered himself with sackcloth, and he sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. Do not let people or animals, herds or flocks taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they had turned from their evil ways, he relented. He did not bring on them the destruction that he had threatened. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for his word to us. You may be seated. Well, when I was little, my grandmother would sometimes uh, stop by our house when she had come into town on a Friday, maybe to do her grocery shopping or to run some other errands. And sometimes, if I was lucky, she would stop by the house and pick me up before she went like to the grocery store or some other store that she needed to go to. Now, this didn't happen often, probably because I was just like every other child. That no matter what the pregame conversation had been with my mother, when you go to the store with grandma, right? I had this tendency of asking a naggingly simple question. You guys know what that question is, right? Yeah, can I have whatever it is, right? Yeah, can I have this? When I was shopping with my parents, I imagined that I had a tendency to ask for, well, everything. <laughs> But when I was with grandma, I remember specifically one thing that I would usually ask for. And by the way, that I would normally get. It wasn't candy, it wasn't junk food, it wasn't a toy. Believe it or not, when I was with this particular grandmother, I would always ask for a brand new yellow legal pad and a pen. You might be asking yourself why? Well, even at a young age, I don't really know what got me interested in this. But from a young age, I had a pretty huge interest in all things Abraham Lincoln. So much so that I really wanted to be a lawyer someday. I wanted to be just like Abraham Lincoln. You can see that my having lived nowhere other than Illinois all of my life makes me out to be, you know, just the greatest poster child for Illinois uh, pride, I suppose. I don't know exactly how I learned that a legal pad and a pen had something to do with a lawyer. Maybe it was from when my mom would watch TV shows like The Young and the Restless or General Hospital and, you know, there was always somebody in court or getting divorced or something of that nature. Well, what do a shopping trip with grandma, a simple yellow legal pad, and a pen have in common with our encounter with Jonah today? Obedience. Simple obedience. 
I'm certain that I feel like I can almost hear my mother and I standing in that big kitchen in our old house in Freeport, Illinois, and these words streaming out of her mouth. Now, you're going to go to the grocery store with Grandma today. Do not be asking her for everything. Grandma's, you know, she's in a hurry. She doesn't get around all that well anyways. Now, knowing me, I'm equally as certain that I dutifully stood there in the kitchen and nodded my head and said, yes, mommy, I understand. All the while in my head, I'm scheming this plan to get a new legal pad and pens. What my mother requested of me in that moment was obedience. What I had planned was, well, not obedience. <laughs> Does it sound like anything you've ever done before? Sound like anything that's ever been true about your relationship with God before? What God gently demands of us is obedience. Usually, though, before we even hear those words pass through the Lord's lips, we're busily, cunningly scheming in our minds a plan around that obedience. We say one thing with our mouths and we prepare our, our minds and our hearts for another thing. Our, par, our poor hearts, they just kind of get tangled up in this mess between our brains and our, and our, and our mouths and it's sort of like, where do I go? What do I do? This morning, Jonah, he's on dry land again, right? But he stands up and he brushes all of that fish slobber off of him. He hears the Lord speaking to him this morning again. Jonah has, I'm going to say, a very similar kitchen conversation with the Lord that I would have had with my mother. God has two critical jobs for Jonah. One of them is, Jonah, actually get up and go this time to Nineveh. The second job request, proclaim my message to them. And I can kind of see Jonah, right? If I was Jonah, standing there going, okay, God, yeah, sure, whatever. But something's different for Jonah this time. Oh, yeah, he just got puked out of a fish. That's what's different. We'd like to hope that Jonah has finally learned his lesson, and in this moment, he's going to listen. He's going to get up, and he's going to go. Before we get to verse 3 of our text, a question comes to mind this morning. What if it was you or I? What if we were the ones who were swallowed up by the big fish, and we were puked out onto dry land again? Would that be enough for you and I? Would we finally have reason to stop and actually listen and submit ourselves fully to God, to everything that he's asking of you. Or even in that moment, after having been, you know, vomited out of the fish, does sin still stand between you and God? Is sin still a factor in your decision-making process? Do you still find yourself scheming for that new legal pad and pen? This morning, I want you to notice a lot of things from our text. The first is this. I want you to notice what God did for Jonah, what God has done for Jonah. The first thing he's done is God has loved Jonah. He has loved him. How can we be so sure that God loves Jonah? Well, I think we actually have to step way back to something we already talked about. Chapter 1 and verse 17, and we'll find our proof there. It says, now the Lord provided a huge fish. To swallow Jonah. If God didn't love him, he would have let him die there at the bottom of that sea. So many times, God's love for us looks less like what we'd expect love to look like, and instead looks a lot more like a practical answer, a practical resolution to some uh, danger or difficulty we find ourselves in. But I want you to notice there, I said practical, something practical. Just because the resolution is a measure of God's love does not necessitate that that resolution would naturally be what we call good. 
For example, in any other circumstance, right, being swallowed up by a big fish, that's not a good thing. But here, when Jonah's faced with the death at the bottom of the sea, God's answer is perfect and his timing is impeccable. So many times recently you've heard me remind you of John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. I've reminded you that we, you and I, we are the whosoever that believeth in him. You and I are the ones that God has so loved that he would give his one and only son to die that we might live. Again, in any other circumstance, we would not nat naturally call uh, the, the, the inhumane death of a man on a cross, crucifixion. We wouldn't call that good. But in our particular situation, right here where we stand, where we sit today, facing death at the bottom of this sea called sin, God's answer is perfect and his timing is impeccable. And by the way, that's why we call it Good Friday. You know, what's more about John 3, 16 is that verse 17 defines God's purpose for us. I urge you, never ever settle for just John 3, 16. When what God wants for you is John 3, 16 and 17. I mean, yes, God did so love the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have eternal life. But then verse 17, for God did not send his son into this world to condemn this world, but that the world might be saved through him. God didn't swallow up Jonah in a big fish to judge Jonah's sinful running away from his call. God swallowed up Jonah to prove to Jonah and to you and I that in spite of all of Jonah's sin, including this most recent running away from the call of God, God still loves Jonah. Listen, wherever you are this morning, wherever you are this morning, wherever it is that you are running from God to this morning, know this, God still loves loves you. The second thing that God has done for Jonah is that God has gone to the greatest lengths to rescue him. God has gone to the greatest lengths to rescue Jonah. Uh, think about it, right? First of all, stormy sea, tiny little boat, big old fish, and now one powerful instance of fish indigestion. God has indeed gone to great lengths. God didn't send that fish into Jonah's life to condemn Jonah. But rather that through that fish, Jonah might have life again. And so here you sit at the bottom of the, sin of the sea of sinfulness. And I need you to know this morning that I believe God's got a fish for you too. Wherever you are, wherever you've run, whatever you've done, God is in pursuit of you. He is ready and willing to bring you back home. I mean, sure, there might be 99 other ones just like you, but you know what? God has his heart set on just this one. The third amazing thing God has done for Jonah is that God has given Jonah a renewed sense of purpose and usefulness. A renewed sense of purpose and usefulness. So God has proven he is willing to go to the greatest lengths in order to bring his sheep home. But why? What's the point of God leaving 99 behind to go after one? Um, by the way, aren't sheep prone to wandering 
no matter how many times you bring them home? The answer is, yeah, we are. We are prone to wandering, but God has a plan for his sheep. Perhaps you know Jeremiah 29 and 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in the future. Can you imagine the conversation between Jonah and God? You know, Jonah's just standing up. He's covered in all of this fish goo, right? And he looks up to heaven. He goes, really, God? Really? And God says, yeah, really, Jonah? For I know the plans I have for you, Jonah. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in the future. Now will you just hush up for a minute and go to Nineveh? The second thing I want you to notice to the, this morning is that God expects something of Jonah. God expects obedience from Jonah. By the way, I want you to also notice that Jonah is obedient. Better late than never, right? To obey. It literally means to comply with the command, direction, request of a personal, uh, a personal request, a personal law. It also means to submit to the authority of a person or a law. I think it's important that we make this one point very clear this morning. Jonah's sin of running away from God's command in his life, it has two very dangerous components to it. First, Jonah did not comply with God's command. Secondly, Jonah was unwilling to submit himself to God's authority. Do you remember when your parents would ask you, I know you've heard this before, right? Ethan, right? Why can't you just do what I ask you to do? Anybody ever say that to their kids? Why can't you just do the, the things I ask you to do, right? What gets us to the moment where our parents say, why can't you just do the things that I ask you to do? What is it that brings you to the place where you you end up having a a mother or a father or some other adult that you respect in your life saying, "Uh, why can't you just do the things you've been asked to do? Uh, You know, it's a silly and pointless question, by the way. I cannot do what I am asked to do. Because that requires me to submit to authority that I am unwilling to to submit to. It it requires me to comply. It requires that I'm no longer in control. It requires that I must listen. It requires that I might not be heard. And, And so the reason that I can't do the things that I'm just asked to do is because sin doesn't like those things. And so... God expects, he demands that Jonah's going to listen, relinquish control, comply, submit. And in our lives, we would go, yeah, that's a lot easier said than done. But look what Jonah did. He did it. Verse 3, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and he went to Nineveh. He did it. Proof positive, we can do it. The Ninevites were pretty awful people. This wasn't a moment when Jonah's saying, all right, you know, I'll go. He's muttering under his breath some mean thing about God as he reluctantly go. There is no stomping of feet across the floorboards on the upstairs floors. There is no slamming of doors. There is no sense of reluctance or hesitancy here. All the text simply says to us is Jonah obeyed. The King James Version of the Bible, I think, translates this word in an interesting way. It translates it differently, for sure. It says, Jonah arose and went. Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh. The use of the term arose here shouldn't be lost on us, because if we consider for just a moment, right, what happened to the Savior of the world when he obeyed? He arose. God expected Jonah to obey. 
God once again reiterated that command to Jonah, go into the great city of Nineveh, proclaim the message that I've given to you, and finally Jonah obeyed. And as a result of that, I'd like you to take notice how Nineveh responds to God's message. Jonah chapter 3 and verse 5 tells us that they believed and they repented. Jonah went, they believed, they repented. Man, if it was only that easy. A fast was proclaimed, all of them, from greatest to the very least. They put on sackcloth, they sat down in dust. The obedience of the Ninevites, though, had very little to do with Jonah and had everything to do with God's word to them. They didn't believe because some crazy, maniacal lunatic who told stories about being swallowed up by a great big fish for three days and then miraculously puked back out again came to them and said, believe. The reason that they believed is because a simple prophet and priest, a man named Jonah, did what he was told to do. He brought the word of God to the people and the people were changed. So often I hear people asking, Pastor, what is it that's going to finally cause this world to change, to wake up, to recognize its sin and change? A lot of times I say, I don't know. Truth is, I know. And it's really not that complex. It doesn't require theatrics or, or miracles or moving mountains or celebrity status. Scripture proves this pattern time and time again when simple, average, everyday people obey the Lord and proclaim his word, the world changes. Sinners repent and believe every single day. And all it takes is one average person of God to bring the word to them that they might be changed. So maybe the song we sang earlier today says it best, actually. It said, when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he shines on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. Jonah obeyed, the people believed. That's a pretty powerful wake-up call for you and I. What will happen when we finally obey and proclaim? I want to leave you with two quick final thoughts, application for your, our lives today. I want you to notice the Assyrian king in this chapter. He responds to God's message in a pretty amazing way. John, uh, Jonah 3 and 6 says, He covered himself with sackcloth and he sat down in the dust. You remember maybe that Mordecai did this when Esther went before King Xerxes. He sat down in sackcloth and in ashes in order to pray for the people as the queen went to beg for their lives. Why do we sit in sackcloth and ashes? Because there is no other place for someone to like this, someone like the king of Assyria or Mordecai or you and I, someone who had been so blatantly and willfully disobeying God. It's interesting when we get to verse nine of the text. This idea of being covered in scratchy cloth and wallowing in dust. Fully overtaken the king, and then in verse 9, we see his real attitude, his real heart attitude. He says, who knows? Maybe God will relent and have compassion on us and turn from his fierce anger so that we won't perish. It sounds to me like the king isn't quite sure whether or not God is real, whether or not we should fully believe in him. He says, who knows? But it isn't a sense of unsurety or, 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 or uh, insincerity here. There is no question about what the king believes here. Verse 9 establishes two important things about the king and what he believes. First, he believes that God does not relent of his anger. 
unless we believe. But when God relents of his anger, people don't perish. And the second thing he knows is that if God doesn't show compassion, people will perish. If the king hadn't trusted God's ability to change this terrible situation that Nineveh found themselves in, that Assyrian king would never ever have put on sackcloth and rolled around in ashes for two reasons. These actions prove that the king has submitted himself to someone else's authority and has complied with it and is submissive to it. No king in their right mind would do this unless they are convinced that that other person that they are submitting themselves to and complying with truly is worthy of being submitted to. So when the king says, who knows, he doesn't need to suggest that there's some question here related to whether or not God is real or whether or not God can do this. The only question is really related to the people. Will we obey him so that he may do these things? Finally, I want you to notice the response of the Ninevites. In John 3 and 10, it said that when they obeyed and repented, God relented. God relented. Skeptics have suggested that this passage is all the proof that anyone needs that Yahweh God is not trustworthy, nor can he truly be sovereign over all things. Why is that? Well, because Jonah chapter 3 sure makes it look like God changed his mind. And if God can change his mind about deciding to not wipe out the Ninevites from the face of the earth for their disobedience, if he can change his mind, then that necessarily opens the door to the fact that God says he might have been wrong. And if God is wrong, then God can't be God. Dr. David Jeremiah suggests that God didn't change his mind here. He didn't suggest he was wrong about anything. I firmly agree. Uh, Dr. Jeremiah says God did not change his mind about Nineveh. Rather, God has made an accommodation. He went into this plan with an or else intention. God said to the Ninevites, 40 days. If you can't get your act together and stop this sinful idolatry and pagan worship and your evil ways and your violence against one another for 40 days, 40 days from now, my fierce anger will be upon you and you're going to perish. Or else, or else what? You know, when we hear an or else, as humans, we normally call the bluff of the person who's saying or else. Right? Or else what? God didn't change his mind. He said, or else you will listen to my word. You will obey me. You will repent. You will believe and you will be saved. God didn't change his mind. He had accommodation in mind from the very beginning. God didn't change his mind about Nineveh. Rather, God has accommodated his people, not their actions. He has accommodated his people, not their actions. What that means simply is this. God loved the sinners and hated the sin. God loved his creation, not their wayward uh, wanderings. God has loved the runner, not the running. That means that God loves you, even though he hates your sin. So the last thing I'll leave you with today as a point of application is that it seems to me that this chapter has given us a real life application tool. We have to trust and obey. For there is quite literally no other way. Amen? Amen. Father God, will you now by the power of your Holy Spirit Awaken in us a sense of trust. Awaken in us a desire to trust you fully, to obey you completely, to submit ourselves and comply with your will. 
Father, that's a fancy way of saying we're ready to stop running. We're tired of running from you, God. We want to be with you. We want to be seen by you. We want to hear you and talk with you. But we recognize our sin stands between you and us. So, Father, will you, as King David prayed, cleanse us with a rod of hyssop? Will you make us whiter than snow? Will you remove that sin from us for no other purpose than that we might obey? That we might trust you, that we might obey you, that we may comply with your will, that we may submit ourselves to you. Father, we pray this in the precious name of Jesus. stand and sing with us and though we haven't lost our minds we're doing it on purpose Brothers and sisters in Christ, I don't know where you are this morning. I don't mean to put words in your mouth. Maybe you're not running from God this morning. Maybe you are. Maybe there's times in the past that you've run from him and you feel some guilt over that. Maybe you're worried about times in the future <laughs> when you might try to put your running shoes on. There's so many moments in our lives where running seems to be a lot easier than staying. You know, the easy way out is to leave, right? The thing that takes courage and strength and trusting and obeying is to stay. And so, would you stay with God? Would you remain near him and by him, beside him? The only way I know for that to happen is that you go forward with the love of God our Father. 
the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ and the power and presence of his Holy Spirit this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Have a wonderful week trusting and obeying in God. And if you are sticking around for our meeting, it is down in the Beacon Room. Thank you.